lot of video game characters feel like they're just plugged into stories arbitrarily. There's actually only, and this is true, 76 voice actors in the entire games industry. Generic man numbers 1 to 74, woman, and Troy Baker. And the characters that these actors bring to life are occasionally brilliant, but all too often have as much flavor as a stick of celery, haphazardly thrown in there as either an obligation or a cheap imitation of another character that works, or as a soulless avatar that's meant to be a vessel for your imagination and contribution to the story, which is code for, yeah, we didn't want to go through the work of actually making a character. Here, you do it. But what's sad about this is that when a game's main character is done correctly, whether through cleverly having them be an actual surrogate for the player or through giving them a strong personality that you briefly inhabit, it can be the final puzzle piece you need for your story to actually work, something that I noticed when playing and discussing Horizon Forbidden West, a game that would have had a much better story if I cared about who was at its center. I released a video not too long ago about video game villains, and that was supposed to be kind of a companion piece to this one. They were initially supposed to come out back to back, but I got lazy for a few days. A month? That video sort of branched out from the ideas that popped into my head when I started jotting down notes for this one. In it, I looked at the basics of the relationship between the player, the main protagonist, and the main antagonist of a game. I mentioned how these relationships need to kind of complement each other in order to work. If a game wants me to sympathize and align with a character's feelings on a bad guy, it needs to directly give me reasons to feel the same instead of just telling me. Or if the intention is for the antagonist to be more effective by feeling like they're talking directly to you, the main character needs to be more passive, maybe even silent. That balance in relationships is important for any story in any format, but because of the element of agency, it becomes a bit more complicated and delicate when the format involves a controller in your hands. In this video, I wanted to zoom in a little bit closer than that bird's eye view perspective and really focus on the relationship between the player and the main character. Because I think getting this right is absolutely imperative to the success of a game's story. It's in my eyes the most important step of that process. That whole hologram bit that I just did is gonna look really cool if my hand placement was right, but if it's not, it's gonna look real stupid. In a landscape of passable or woefully miscalculated leads, let's take a look at good video game main characters and the importance of voice, choice, and presence oice that that didn't work well at all The flexibility that you have with the presence of a game's main character might not be the medium's most important discernible feature, but it may well be its most overlooked. A game like Firewatch can win Best Indie at the Golden Joystick Awards carried almost entirely by its narrative, one that also netted it a GDC award for that very category, and yet to my recollection, you never see either of the main characters' faces outside of a few photographs. The entire experience is built off the back of their voices, combining the visual and auditory advantages that movies have while using the game's medium to be a bit more adventurous with how those visuals are presented to you and how you connect with who it's at its core. Taking it a step further, Chell from Portal or Jack from Bioshock, examples that you'll recognize if you did watch that villains video, are not only never visible unless you place portals in a strategic way to check yourself out, but are also voiceless, if we ignored this scene, but you know what I mean. In the villains video, I touch on the idea that despite what logic might dictate, having these characters exist only through their actions, affecting the world by completing tasks or puzzles, but never actually contributing any dialogue, was absolutely essential for these antagonists to work, and it's also essential for these stories to work. In terms of games being a true window into another world, I think this transparent characterization achieves that in the purest sense. One could argue that given the lack of real choice in these games, that's not true, but I think we're still pretty far away from an experience that features choices which don't feel predetermined or restrictive while also having a believable and complex impact, and while the illusion of being transported somewhere else still remains. I feel like somewhere along the way, we started viewing the most immersive experiences as the ones where we got to make the most decisions, explore the biggest, most dense worlds, and talk to the most interesting people, but the more options that we're offered, Offered, the more we're sometimes given contrived systems that offer choice as an illusion or as filler, even basic conversations can feel gamified, and those things aren't necessarily bad, but they do fly in the face of immersion. I think the most immersive experiences are the ones where it feels like the game is talking to you. There isn't a buffer, some voice, or even some text between you and the characters. Games like Dwarf Fortress are certainly achievements in complex storytelling, but when used properly to depict narratives of agency, chaos, or escape like Portal and Bioshock, effectively removing the character part of your main character can actually lead to the most immersive storytelling, at least that's how I see it. The limitation, of course, is that that kind of creates a look but don't touch scenario. Choice is all but non-existent, you only have an effect on the world that it wants you to have, and so if that constraint isn't used in service of the story, it completely negates how enraptured you are in the world, pun intended. To me, that's why the best games with these types of protagonists are the ones whose central conceit is the idea of control, and perhaps breaking through it, even though that might be the unavoidable path of the game which you have no say in. The Stanley Parable is a game all 
all about this. The title character Stanley says nothing throughout the whole game, but the narrator guides you through a simple scenario. If you disobey him, his story starts to unravel and he points out how you're choosing something rather than listening to the game and it breaks around you, but it breaks as intended, as designed. There's no such thing as freedom of choice in this game or any other narrative because you're still following a predetermined route. But to tell this meta narrative about choice, they needed a main character who wasn't a main character at all. He was just a name imposed on the player and nothing else. A lack of any character presence whatsoever in fiction is something that video games can pull up that's only really rivaled by books, but historically it's only worked with a very specific type of narrative, otherwise the story feels like it has no anchor. Some characters are all presence and almost nothing else. Doomguy and Master Chief say little if anything in their respective games, but their mere existence feels important to the overall world. They strike fear into their enemies, they may inspire courage in their allies, and all of a sudden, despite having nothing or almost nothing to say whatsoever, just like those other examples, we've transformed from the idea of control to that of a power fantasy, polar opposites just by changing the attitude and reverence that the adjacent characters have towards you. These NPCs are no longer in their own world soliloquizing and asking you to view them through a glass window, they're fumbling backwards at the sight of you or showing you a begrudging respect. It's so crazy how suddenly everything shifts just by changing how much a character's existence matters to everything around them. How one silent protagonist can have superpowers and a huge array of weapons and feel like a puppet while another feels like a god, just because here the character melted away and made you feel vulnerable, and here he commands whatever room he's in, making you feel powerful. I want to point out that this is why Far Cry 5 silent protagonist feels so flat for me, another thing that I mentioned in that other video, I promise this is the last time I'm mentioning it. The game's main character and its execution seems to be at odds with what the narrative wants to do. People talk to you and act like you've taught them something insightful, even though your dude can't even be bothered to give an anime grunt. Your character feels as if they're non-existent, as if the game wants you to look at this world in a less personal way, like a madhouse whose story you're watching unfold, and yet it forces you to be a centerpiece that's inspiring a revolution. It keeps acting like you're making friends because you shot a bunch of bad guys to save them, but how am I supposed to be invested in that when my guy isn't saying anything? These people are relying on me for their state of mind and what's happening with them. It's no longer an impersonal thing, but it still has an impersonal execution. Give me something to attach myself to for God's sake. The idea of a character's presence and how much it affects a story isn't just restricted to silent protagonists, but it's easy to dissect it in these instances because there's nothing else really muddying the waters. Kratos is a fully voiced character with a strong presence and that presence does affect how you interact with the game, but of course when a character's other personality traits get brought into the process, things get a bit more complex. If the last section was a discussion about how a game can create a bridge between itself and the player, whether through melting away the middleman so you in real life are the center of the story, or creating a powerful role for you to imagine yourself in, this one is all about how a character can actively separate itself from you, and how that can actually be a good thing. By the character's voice, I don't necessarily mean how they sound like, I'm talking about their agency, their personality, one that you can either relate to or clash with, but it's what makes that character that character. A focus on this element alone, if used improperly, can sometimes lead you to think why some something had to be a video game in the first place, but that doesn't mean that creating a voiceless, characterless surrogate is the only way to use the medium effectively, nor does it mean that just slapping on the ability to make choices to have an impact is a good solution. In fact, sometimes the interplay between yourself and this person who is their own entity is why the storyline actually works. In the simplest of cases, I think giving your main character a relatable personality with a healthy dose of banter is a good way to visualize yourself in the scenario better, my go-to example always being Nathan Drake. Nate's either the version of yourself that you wish you were, or seems like he could be your buddy, with a fun supporting cast around him that really grounds the insanity of the Uncharted franchise. Despite plenty of games having crazy set pieces, I find they make significantly less of an imprint onto my brain and just feel like random destruction compared to Uncharted. Cause not only does that franchise actively have me doing crazy stuff, but the character it's happening to is freaking out and making jokes about it and arguing with his friends. Without this, it would feel like general mayhem, and without the interactive element like you see in an action movie for example, it's cool to view as an outsider, but here it really comes together and you feel like you're part of the adventure with your friends. Which is why it was so silly seeing headlines like, oh my god, Hollywood can't even get Uncharted right, how are they gonna make a movie out of anything else? Like, this was designed as a game, it works best as a game, everyone who says the Uncharted games are basically just a movie because they're linear is just grossly oversimplifying the design of these titles. Poor character work is what I think makes the new Tomb Raider games far less impactful than Uncharted despite Lara Croft being such a tenured character. I can't remember the story and the excitement of those games because it all felt disconnected to me, the characters didn't make me feel involved in what was happening. And with that said, I'm not mentioning Uncharted for another three months because it's starting to sound like I've only played one game in my entire life. No Nathan Drake for three months, I promise. Unless I forget, 
which I probably will. Even more interesting though is when a game is able to feature a character that has nothing to do with me as a way to either conceivably see myself in that scenario they're presenting or to gain an understanding of a completely new perspective on life. For example, uh, you may have noticed this despite how well I hide it, but uh, I am not white. I am in fact North Korean. But despite being a minority, I can't begin to understand what it feels like to be another minority. African American in the 1960s, for example, or you know, an African American right now. I can't even really understand how it feels to be my own ethnicity in more volatile conditions. There are so many perspectives out there that we might not even be that far removed from, but can still be eye-opening regardless, and there's power in absorbing even a fraction of that. And far be it from a video game to suddenly make me realize how that person feels in that situation, but to provide a character going through those struggles as the character that you play as allows the game to use more subtle behaviors and systems to pack a greater punch. Mafia 3 simply would not be able to tell its story if its main character was just a vessel for me to impart myself on. So much of the story depends on who Lincoln is, not who I am. Unlike a movie though, the interactive element allows this idea to be furthered through gameplay as well. Police responses and actions vary depending on how white the neighborhood is where you committed a crime. White people smoke a distance away from their African American co-workers, old ladies grab onto their purses when you walk by them, and that last one only really works when there's a distinction made between me and the person that I'm playing as because I've never seen an old woman clutch her purse as I walk by, mainly because, you know, their feeble bodies would still be able to knock my ass out, so this really only works in fiction. Again, I'm not saying that I was playing Mafia 3 going, whoa, racism is real? No way! But the story that they created, which is pretty effective in my opinion, is rooted in the idea of this character being something that I'm not, plain and simple. Even past the race aspect, which uh, it, this is a sentence that I promise is gonna end well despite that very worrying beginning. Even past the race aspect, I'm also just generally a certified pansy, okay? I'm too scared to pocket a box of Tic Tacs from 7-Eleven and fear that the police are gonna track me down with a helicopter and put me in a maximum security prison, so needless to say, I can't exactly see myself as a crime lord, so if I'm gonna be part of a story where that's what I become, maybe give me a whole different personality that I can pretend to have. I've seen so much discourse over the years about how predominantly linear stories where you have little to nothing to do with a decision-making process doesn't belong in games, and I've really pushed back against that. People always say a game needs freedom, it needs agency, but for every reason that I just went through, sometimes a game's story is better when you're asked to be somebody who's not you. What Remains of Edith Finch is a game where you embody multiple different characters for brief moments, all connected by a single person's discovery of their family's secrets. It's a walking simulator where you basically move to the places that the game wants you to and do what it says, with heavy use of narration and text appearing directly in front of you inside the world every time a character speaks. It's basically a novel, right? Or at best, a very straightforward movie. Except, neither of those things can explain explain depression and apathy through representing the monotony of life in a way you can actually feel and experience yourself. Your focus on the shiny imaginary world off to the side as the actions of your real life begin to feel robotic. They can't let you inspect the hallways and rooms at your leisure and embody these characters so quickly and completely in mere minutes. The first person view helps convey that for a brief moment these thoughts are your own even though they're so obviously outlined in front of you. And despite being a linear game carried solely on the back of its narrative and characters, it not only works but it feels like it needs to be a game, and the multiple characters are so key to that. My favorite example of this though is Hellblade, where you play as a character suffering from crippling psychosis. The voices in Senua's head are constantly muttering and whispering throughout the experience, and when you're wearing headphones, the mixing of the audio has allowed them to truly feel like they're breathing down your neck. I was constantly getting shivers playing this game, it was like self-doubt ASMR. The voices never let you forget that they exist, and their mere presence feels like they're muddling your experience in the way that the game intends. Sometimes I was trying to solve the simplest of puzzles, and I just couldn't focus because of them. I wanted to just take my headphones off so I could clear my mind, but that felt so disingenuous to the situation I was being presented, so I gritted my teeth and pushed on. It's such an incredible narrative device that sometimes gets turned up to 11, like this scene where everything's on fire and everyone's screaming at you and you're being chased down by something and you need to somehow escape. It's harrowing and intense, flipping the standard player character dynamic backwards. Instead of me imposing parts of myself onto the character, they were imposing themselves onto me, drastically affecting the way I was experiencing that space, and that's something really special. Special. On the other hand, if a main character's personality is that of a wet towel, then you don't feel like you have enough say on your end, they don't feel like they have a compelling enough voice to really have a perspective that changes anything for you, and at that point, the ensuing disconnect is far greater than it would be for a movie because you're being pulled apart from two ends. Unfortunately, it feels like a lot of games think that wet towel personality is perfectly fine as long as you give the player dialogue options to make the character their own. They're not boring, they can be whatever you want them to be. Isn't that great? No.
Now, I'll be honest with you, the topic of choice in video games could be its own 15 minute video, and I don't wanna add 15 minutes to the 16 or so minutes it already took me to get here, so I'm mainly gonna be just talking about this as it pertains to the last two sections, and just leave some of my other thoughts for a later day. I've always personally had a problem with dialogue systems that feel like they take the place of where a character's general personality would otherwise go. Not just because a lot of modern examples seem to be getting shallower and offer choices that have little to no impact, but also because a dialogue wheel will never be able to provide the actual response I would give in whatever scenario I'm being presented. Sometimes I might want to be a bit more nuanced than the game lets me, sometimes I don't have a thought either way, sometimes I might want to start more empathetic and then follow it by a stern warning instead of one or the other. It's hard to capture human interaction in multiple choice form, and that's why I think it's a great way to let me bend the character the way that I want, but not a great way to build the entirety of a character's personality. I think a good embodiment of what I like is Gerald from the hit game Witcher Guy 3, The Final Witchening. We immediately see the basis of his personality in the prologue, and if you asked anyone who's played the game to quickly describe his character, you'd probably get some variation of he's a rough and gruff guy with questionable morals, but deep down he does have a heart. In a game where you can decide how your character will react to every situation, how he'll treat people, etc., I think it's still imperative to have something concrete outside of those decisions, something universal. I can't change the fundamentals of Geralt's person, but I can change the specifics. Depending on if I want to give bad people second chances or refuse to forgive them, I can flesh out the details of who he is in my eyes. He's still a man with a tough exterior and a somewhat soft interior, but I can decide if that emotional fortress he's got is only breachable by a select few people, or if it's more of a flimsy front put up by somebody who's much kinder than he'd like to let on. Because of this, I can choose to skew him to my exact way of thinking, or I can make him as cheery as I possibly can, or I can try and make decisions based on who I believe he is, or if I wanted to, I could just make him a horrible piece of garbage to see how that turns out. And through all of that, he's still the same base character. My choice is still important, but the character is not just my own complex beliefs packaged into four or less convenient options. Disco Elysium allows you to personalize your character to be anything from a suave ladies man to a sad husk of a human being. It lets you solve problems using intuition or intelligence or, you know, it lets you not solve problems at all and instead create more for yourself. You can spec out your character's traits as you wish and use them to play the game your way while also affecting which parts of his brain inform your adventure going forwards. Eventually you craft your overall personality, but it's made up of predetermined traits that have their own presence and voice. The game intersperses inner monologues and random thoughts between moments of dialogue and choice, all with completely different personalities, and in the final cut version, all with completely different voices. The voice acting especially helps these traits come to life. Some sound bold and authoritative, some small and mousy. And depending on if you put more points into volition or composure or half flight, those traits with higher priority will appear more, dictate your chances in completing certain tasks more, and affect the outcomes of conversations. They each change how the world and characters interact with you, as well as influence how the world is fed to you. The game gives you a bunch of possibilities for who you are, you have full control over what you choose and what to focus on, and that'll lead to a strong overall voice because of how it's all set up. It takes a lot of the building blocks of the last two sections and lets you mix and match them through choice, which is much better to me than pick mean option, pick nice option, pick option to not nuke people. I'm not really a real person there, I'm just the accumulation of a bunch of disparate decisions and it sucks me out of what I'm doing. I could go on to talk about games with black and white decisions like Infamous, or games where the lack of choice is the actual basis of the narrative like The Last of Us, but that just feels like it would take too long. At the end of the day, there's a lot of characters that we could dissect to see what works and what doesn't. Aloy, the inspiration for this whole video, feels like a character with hardly any discernible characteristics or leanings seemingly because they wanted you to decide if she was headstrong or sharp or kind yourself. But with such vague and infrequent options, she feels like a slab of white bread. Shadow Warrior 3 has gameplay that really makes you feel powerful, but Lo Wang and especially Hoji make you want to play with cotton stuffed in your ears. They ruin that illusion. Their presence somewhat negates the effectiveness of the power fantasy. Deathloop features great voice acting and the same unignorable and visually represented dialogue as Edith Finch, but in a game where you repeat things so often, it gets a little bit much when you hear the same confused and angry style of dialogue every time you come back. A good video game main character is not a single thing. It's not tied to your genre or what's worked in the past. It's not something that has to be translucent or have the same guidelines as a movie main character. It's incredibly dependent on your narrative, which is why this video isn't called How to Create a Good Main Character. I don't know the answer to that. I'm stupid. But given the best ones can call for self-reflection or completely immerse us in a universe or can truly allow us to experience life through somebody else's eyes, considering how they're the linchpin of a game's story and world and how you perceive it, we should at least acknowledge that they're way more important than we sometimes act like they are. What do you guys think? Is there a preference either way that you have for what kind of main characters you like? I personally really like variety. Sometimes I want to be myself. Sometimes I want to be somebody else. But I want to see if people actually like one thing over the other. But with that said, um... 
If you enjoyed the video, leave a like. Uh, if you're new here, subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. Peace.